I don't know what we can talk about in this nation without talking about white superiority, honestly. Who defines the meaning of God also defines the relationship between economy and God. African Americans spent $1.3 trillion last year, making us the 16th wealthiest nation in the world. Why have we not turned those riches into wealth to develop our community? Peace family. I am so happy to be um, in the house with you, you guys this evening. Uh, we are prepared to just get ready for this um, presentation or this dialogue, this conversation we're about to have with um, Dr. Milana Karenga. It is it's going to be enlightening. He was already enlightening me before we even got up, up like we, before we even became live. So this is going to be great. Um, I just want to first just give a shout out to everybody who is here, um, you know, early and Hazmina, no, Hazina, Hazina, I hope I am saying your name right. You already busted our little cash app. That's what's up. Thank you so much, Hazmina, for your donation. And let me tell you a little bit about the donations. So when you guys donate money, this money goes straight back into the community. Everything that we do, like down to the graphic, our graphic artists, um, today I have on my happy shirt, one of five different ones that if you go into our website, you can, um, you know, you can check out and get your own, but down to the people who put it in, well, it's not people, it's just my son who does the merchandise, <laughs> the, um, but everybody that we pay, we pay from you guys' donations. So we really appreciate anything that you guys, um, give us nothing's too small and definitely nothing's too big. If you want to, you know, um, uh, donate. And I want to say shout out to DM. He's always in the house. Um, Chago, Sharon, so nice to see you. Bakari, Jacqueline, um, and um, Dennis, Dennis Boatwright from Detroit. Uh, Dennis is um, going to be crucial in helping us um, get, you know, get our elders to the conference. The conference, the One Africa Conference uh, that will be happening in Detroit, April 30th and May 1st. It is going to be fantastic right here. It's the power of unity. In fact, let me just make it bigger so everybody can see it. Um, it's going to be the power of unity conference. Power in unity. Because we have power when we work together. That's just that's just how it is. We have power when we work together. Please go to happyfilm.com and get your tickets. Um, if you're in the Detroit area, you just need to be there. And we have a few little tickets left, <laughs> okay? So I'm telling you now, if you were thinking about like, oh, I think I might roll up in you know, Detroit and see it, you got to get your tickets now, okay? We will be announcing something special next week concerning the conference. So make sure you tune in um, to our, our conversation that we will be having with Ron Spears and Infudishi Juhuti Miss. That will be next week. Um, so please, this One Africa Conference is super important. This was supposed to happen in Egypt. And then there was a group of people who felt like as, as, um, as who we were showing up, that we did not have the right to change history. And so therefore um, there was a lot of drama and we had to move the state side. So we are excited. I am from the D. I live in New York, but I'm from the D. And so I'm happy that we will be in Detroit and, um, you know, just being part of this One Africa Conference. So please get your tickets if you have not gotten them. And if you're not going to be there, we have live streams. You can be anywhere in the world. And we hope that you are anywhere in the world. Um, this is not just for African-Americans sitting here in the United States. This is for black folks in the Caribbean, black folks in Africa, black folks in Brazil, Iceland, all them places because black people are everywhere. All right. So we need to be up in this house right here at the power um, in unity one Africa conference. Now you're going to keep up. You're going to keep hearing us say this. We're going to be on every type of platform you can think of saying the same thing today. We are tired. We are tired of not get having our independence. And this is one of the ways that we can start to regain what it is that we have lost over the years. We have each other and in having each other is how we can make this happen. But it only works. This only works, guys, if we work together. 
It doesn't matter how we're getting there as long as our intention is the same. And so this One Africa Conference, because we have different, we have are going to have speakers from all different walks of life, all different philosophies, but they all stand the same thing. And that's, that's the piece. Sometimes we get caught up in how someone's saying it, why they like that. It don't matter. Our tenements, our four tenements um, with the Hoppy Movement. Number one, love black people. Everyone at this conference, love black people. Number two, support black business. Everybody at this conference, support black business. Number three um, is becoming more financially astute with your money. Everyone at the conference is doing that. Number four is to teach the youth the truth. Everyone in our conference is doing that. So it's very important that if you cannot be there, it's okay, but get your streaming ticket. Our goal is to get 1 million black folks onto that stream and seeing this. This is a day where you need to, if you work and take off, sit down with your family. We talk about these people that are going to be these presenters coming about how there are national treasures. Let's treat them like that. Let's treat them like there are national treasures. Let's take off work. Let's sit down and let's listen to what they have to say. And then what's more important is that after we listen to what they say, we move to action because it's nice to listen to stuff. It's nice to read a book. But if we're not doing stuff, if we're not practicing loving, loving each other, if we ain't practicing supporting each other with our business, if we're not um, you know, trying to get right with our money. And if we ain't teaching our youth the truth, then we're doing nothing. OK, so I will get off my soapbox <laughs> right now. But I am telling you, this is going to be fabulous and you want to be a part of it. Don't you wait to the last minute trying to get these tickets, okay? Because we we cannot guarantee nothing. We can get guarantee that live stream, okay? But you want to get on, get onto that that um, that internet, uh, you know, uh, little uh, road that they have up there that sometimes they want us on when they don't want us on. But we need to be up there. We need to be ready with our, uh, you know, notepads out. Like I'm, we're getting ready. To, I'm getting ready to sit, you know, down and have a conversation with Dr. Karenga. I have my paper and I have my pen, and because I'm always taking notes, but it's not about taking notes. It's about looking at them notes and actually doing stuff. All right, enough is enough. Um, I am so excited <laughs> to have Dr. Karenga, and I will be bringing him in now. Hey, Dr. Karenga, how are you doing? Fine, Felice. It's good to see you. Nice to bring this piece. Yes, yes. Um, all right. We we've been getting like a lot of emails uh, today. When we sent out, um, you know, our our newsletter, and everybody, make sure if you're not signed up to the see if you were signed up to the newsletter, you would know that Dr. Karenga was coming early morning, or excuse me, last night. But if you're not part of that newsletter, you, you had to find out like everyone else had to, like on our social media. So make sure you go to happyfilm.com and sign up for the newsletter. So, Dr. Karenga, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine, and you, Felicia? Okay. That's good. All right, well, we're just going to jump into this conversation. Um, well, we should introduce me if you have a bio. Oh, you know what? I do not have your bio. How okay. do I not have your bio? Okay. But no, you know, I can get a bio. Okay, so let's talk while we look at <laughs> Yeah. Let no, me. Any... Yeah. Yeah, you know what? I'm so sorry. I get so excited about it's okay. um, to what you said. Yes. And uh, mm -hmm. Yes. No, no. I I no no no, I have it. Good. I'm glad. Yeah. Because yeah. I was putting that everywhere. I put that in our in the beginning is a word, you know? And the word yes. is music. <laughs> yes. And the music was rhythmic. Dogon conversation about the <gasps> vibrations in creation. <laughs> That's a whole different kind of conversation, too. Yes. It's a deep one. A deep one. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So, Dr. Malinga Karanga, Malana, Dr. Dr. Malana Karanga, he is the professor and chair at the Department of Africana Studies at Cal State at Long Beach, and he's also the creator of Kwanzaa. Who goes? Who goes? In Guzo Sava. In Guz in Gazo, in Guzo, and the Guzo Saba seven principles. Saba, yes, uh, yeah, which I which I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I practice Kwanzaa. <laughs> um, so I'm so excited for you to be here this uh -huh. evening. Yeah. Um, and we need to make sure we understand that he's the creator of Kwanzaa. 
and it's a Pan-African holiday that celebrates family, community, and culture. And I'm also chair of the organization US, which celebrates its 57th anniversary this year uh, in September. And we call it 57 years of unbudging blackness, right? We've held to it. We see Africa as a moral idea. We don't go to Sweden or France or any other country to find out who we are. Mm -hmm. Our argument is always self is culturally grounded, self-determining and representing the best of what it means to be African and human in the world. I'm also chair of the National Association of Kawita Organization, NACO, which has chapters around the uh, country. And uh, it is based on my philosophy, Kawita. Kawita is an um, ongoing synthesis of the best of African thought and practice in constant exchange with the world. And it is out of Kawita philosophy that I created Kwanzaa and the Nguzo Saba. And I pose that as a option for us to understand and assert ourselves in the world. Because we argue that how we understand ourselves shapes and dictates even how we assert ourselves in the world. And if we have a deformed or diminished conception of ourselves, that's how we assert ourselves in the world. And you know our oppressor continuously tries to present our deformed and diminishes conceptions of ourselves. Mm -hmm. mm. And that we do called resistance. We resist that in everything we do. Hmm? Yes. And Kawita, I should say this too, just to set the framework for how we talk. Kawita is what we call a cultural nationalist uh, philosophy, which is a revolutionary cultural nationalist. People used to get conceptually clumsy and try to, you know, make a distinction between revolutionary nationalism and cultural nationalism. But revolutionary and culture are two different kinds of things. Revolutionary, like progressive or reformist or backward or conservative, those represent qualities of social motion and thought, right? But con uh, culture, religion, politics, and economic, those represent emphasis, areas of emphasis on what we want to concentrate, right? So we concentrate on culture. But then the question is, what do we mean by culture? Do we mean song and dance? Our opponents used to say that. I mean, they're not here as much as they were before, but they used to say, well, you know, y'all just want to do African clothes and, you know, do that in the dance. No, they knew that. They were lying then and they knew it, right? But that's the kind of, uh, kind of ideological struggle sometimes we have, which are unprincipled and unproductive. So what is culture? And when us, the organization us and Kawita says culture, what do we mean by culture? We mean the totality of thought and practice by which a people creates itself, celebrates, sustains and develops itself and introduces itself to history and humanity, right? So culture is vital to us. It's how we create ourselves, right? How we celebrate and sustain and develop ourselves and then introduce ourselves to history and humanity. And that occurs, Felicia, on at least seven levels, right? This is how we try to understand ourselves as Africans on these levels, at the basic, right? There's, we can do more, but we have to do this basic. The first one is, of course, history. I mean, our, our awesome movement through time and space, right? We got, we get, that's culture, right? Second is uh, religion or spirituality. I like the word spirituality, which is spirituality and ethics, right? Uh, that's there, right? We all have this. That's part of our culture. Third, social organization, how we build our families and communities, how we build our relationships with each other, economic organizations, how we provide goods and, and services and ensure the material security uh, and development of our people and political organization, how we gain, maintain, and use power, not over and against anyone, but power to realize our will to do good into the world. For we are the Odu Ifa, the sacred text of uh, uh, ancestors, uh, the Yoruba uh, said, uh, 78 1, that we are, let's do things with joy. For truly, we are the humans are divinely chosen, divinely chosen to bring good into the world. And we're chosen not over and against anyone, 
not chosen by itself, but chosen with everyone to do one thing, to bring good into the world. And we argue in Kawita, that is the fundamental, um, that is the fundamental mission and meaning of human life, right? And then we move from uh, a social organization, an economic and political organization, we move to creative production. That's the next level, the sixth level of culture or sixth era of culture. And creative production means your art, your music, your literature, your dance, et cetera. And then finally, ethos. And that's the collective psychology we achieve as a result of practice in those other six areas, right? This is how we understand ourselves. Fathers and mothers of human civilization, for example, right? They're seeing ourselves as the elders of humanity, the people who stood up first, spoke the first human truth and taught the world who was good and beautiful and sacred, right? So, so this is important. And we see ourselves as also sons and daughters of the Holocaust of enslavement, right? Mm. What does that mean to us? It means I, we have this awesome value for freedom and justice, right? And we we, we, we can take uh, 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 Nana Harriet Tubman. Nana is an honorific. It means honored one or one deserving honor. So Nana Harriet Tubman teaches us what freedom is, right? And one of the things we say about history, right? is that we, we got to stop using our culture as a reference and use it as a resource. So when we're talking freedom, bring the minds of our people to bear on this discussion, right? What does freedom mean? And Harry Tubman, Nana Harry Tubman gives us an excellent example. And she says, you know, when she freed herself, now, first of all, she doesn't free herself by herself. Her mother and father ground her, right? They're visiting uh, ministers that come, the black, ministers that come, women and men come teach her about the beauty of freedom. And, and she uh, is taught by her mother and father how to read signs in the forest, right? How to read the map of heaven. And she studies and learns the ways of the oppressor, the, the rounds that they make, the patrols that they send out. You know, what is their defense, right? What is their aggressive point? She learns all of that. She can't just run away. She got to learn this because she's going to come back to get other people. And so when she crossed the line of freedom, she says, I was so happy. And the sun came through the trees and turned the leaves all gold. And I thought I was in heaven. But immediately I became sad. Why? Because all the people I love were back there still on the plantation, my mother and father, my other relatives. And she said, I declared that day that I would share the beauty of this with all my people, right? And so at that moment, Felicia, an artist, she redefined freedom from individual escape to the collective practice of self-determination in and for community. So you could also see freedom as just getting away yourself. But she said, no, that's not freedom for me. Freedom. I need all of us to be here. That freedom is indivisible. This is not a Harriet Tubman's fundamental message here. Freedom is indivisible. Justice is indivisible. All the goods in life are the great goods. I'm not talking about personal pleasures. I'm talking about the great goods by which we understand and develop our humanity and come into the fullness of ourselves. All that is a shared good. Right. Mm. And so what she demonstrated by that is that we have to struggle to expand the arc of inclusion in all the good that we get and share. We must include our people in all of this. And when we get to reparations, we'll talk about that also. So I just want you to see that. So and then I want I want you to now go to what cultural nationalism is. You know, cultural nationalism assumes as Malcolm taught us, Nana Malcolm X, Nana Haji Malcolm X, taught us that we're a nation. And then Kawita says, we're a culture nation struggling to come into political existence, to control the space we occupy, to free ourselves and to be ourselves, right? And to come into the fullness of ourselves. That's our struggle. It's always been a dual one, Black people, always a dual one, to be ourselves and to free ourselves. And we know we can't free ourselves unless we be ourselves. You know, you can't free Black people if you keep saying you're not Black, right? So you got to be yourself in order to free yourself. But you can't freely, full, freely, fully free yourself until you fully 
be yourself, right? And you can't fully be yourself until you fully free yourself. So we have to create the conditions for us to be fully ourselves. And that's a condition of freedom. Not only freedom from, but freedom to. Freedom from domination, deprivation, and degradation. And then freedom to develop, to flourish, and come into the fullness of ourselves. So cultural nationalism says we are this culture nation struggling to be ourselves and free ourselves in the fullest and most beautiful form. And it is informed by three fundamental principles and propositions. First, that the defining feature of any people and nation is its culture. I repeat, the defining feature of any people or nation is its culture. Second proposition, that for a people to be itself, it must free itself, right? And it must be self-determining. For people to be itself, it must be self and free itself, it must be self-determining. Pardon me, it should be first self-conscious. For people, I'm gonna say this, for people to be itself and free itself, it must be self-conscious, self-determining, and rooted in its own culture self-conscious, self-determining, and rooted in its own culture. And the third principle of culture nationalism is, is that the quality of life of a people and the success of its liberation struggle depends upon its waging cultural revolution within mm. and political revolution without, resulting in the radical reconception, reconstruction and transformation of self, society, and the world. A lot of the revolutionary theories stress just trying to change in society. But our revolutionary theory of Kawita culture nationalism argues we must change ourselves in the process and practice of the struggle to change society. For mm -hmm. as Fanon, Nana Franz Fanon said, the national liberation struggles is achieved to the precise degree that each person takes it upon themselves to irreversibly begin their own liberation mm. in the context of the liberation of the people. And he goes on to say, because real decolonization is not simply the decolonization of the land, but the end of the decolonized person. Yes. That's what we want to do. We want to take this decolonized mind and free it so that it can free its body, it can free its life, mm -hmm. right? That's the important thing. So that's what culture national, and that's what I teach. And I've taught this since the 60s. I developed my uh, philosophy of Kawaita, and uh, it has informed all my activity. And those things that you see from the 60s um, that uh, have lasted. Uh, whether it has to do with Kwanzaa and the Guzo Saibo or the Black Arts Movement or the Black Studies and Black Student Movement, Kawita played a significant vanguard role in all of these movements. The Black Power Movement, the Black Liberation the uh, uh, Theology Movement, all those things that we talk about uh, uh, that Kawita had an important and significant role in. And, th and that's, of course, the basis. Mm -hmm. So now, with with uh, with you with the celebration, are you doing anything special in terms of you know how can we be a part of the celebration of the mm -hmm. fifty seven years? Okay, so we're going to do two major seminars. One on Maat, the moral idea in ancient Egypt, right, oh. which I wrote in my second dissertation on, and then yes. we're going to do uh, one on Ifa. The Odu Ifa, which I translated and made available uh, to the people from an ethical point. I don't do demonation. I just do ethics, right? So I extracted ethical texts from these long, beautiful uh, texts um, uh, of the Odu Ifa, uh, the texts of ancient Yoruba land, and still a living tradition, right? An active tradition. And that's from my argument that we have to practice Sankofa, reach back and retrieve mm -hmm. the best of our culture and history and use it to ground ourselves, orient ourselves, and direct our lives toward good 
and expansive ends. And so we're going to do these seminars. Uh, we do the seminar first on Mott, which should be in May. And then we're going to do the second one in the, in the month of our 57th anniversary, which is October. And so we will send out invitations to that. And we'll come and talk with you about that. And uh, we hope that your listeners will participate in that if they love my in this. And I, and I want you, I think you know this, and we've been on the program and said this, and when Dr. Smalls was on it and Dr. Jeffrey, that, you know, we, we did a lot to formulate the conversation we're having now about my, the reason you have this happy on here. It comes from the struggle that our organization ways in the early 80s uh, to rescue and reconstruct this struggle. Now, so in our organization, we began to take Diop. We read Diop earlier, but we, we, we wanted to have a spiritual foundation and an ethical foundation uh, that represent an ancient teaching and a wisdom that we could bring forth as a, a modern option for understanding and approaching uh, uh, issues in our lives, right? And yes. we chose Egypt first because Egypt had uh, a presence before the coming of the European, right? So we get some authenticity here. And we got, second, we got their own text, their own words. So we don't have to have anthropological interpretations of what they believe, right? We got their own words and we can read it like anybody else, right? And then because of the abundance of documents, because of the level of achievement and because of what it means uh, to the rest of all of Africa and to the world. And so what we did is say, we're gonna create, we're gonna create a movement around the concept of Ma'at because I believed then and now that the most, one of the most, I should say one of the most, allowed for us, one of the most important ways we can engage Egypt is to talk about its ethics and spirituality. And yes. Mott becomes a fundamental issue. Yes. And I chose yes. Mott as a fundamental way for engaging Egypt. And then I created a vocabulary around that, Mottian ethics, right? The seven cardinal virtues of Mott I, I laid out. Then Mottian ontology, right? So in Mottian environmental ethics, right? So I, I not only put the force on that, I began to create the categories. And then we said, let's create an organization where we can achieve two or three things because I had started translating the text and I had already did the opening of the Husia. You, do you know about the Husia? Have you heard yes, of it? I, yes, I actually ordered it from you. Good, I'm glad. <laughs> from, yep. from, from, from St. Coy Press, not from me. Yeah. It's not my press, it's a sister's press, St. Coy okay. Press. Yes. Yeah, so anyhow, uh, uh, so, 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 so our organization, I said, let's train ourselves to be saber, more teachers. Now, a lot of people start using that just like they start using master teacher. That was my, one of my, um, names from the sixes. Maulana means master teacher. My organization gave me that name. Then I have a second name in Davizita that came from the movement, which means constant soldier and constant concern for the enemy. My last name, Karenga, means keeper of the tradition, which I, took myself. I, I I did that. That was my first name that, that I took. And I had Pan-African aspect to my name. The first one is Swahili, Maulana. The second one is Zulu and Davizita. And the third is Gikuyu to show that I don't choose one ethnic group. I choose the whole of Africa as my history, my culture. And one my Africa. History. One Africa. We have, we, have, we have to say that. And Africa is not simply a continent. It's also yes. a world community. And we have to remember that Otherwise, we'll always be playing junior brother and junior sister to the continental <laughs> African. You know, and I'm not into that. You know, okay. So, 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 so just just to tell you about that. So, we called in 1984 the first ancient Egyptian uh, studies ethical conference, and we have several reasons for that. As I was saying, first to introduce the concept of Mott as a central way of talking about Egypt. Now, this has become a major issue. You know, with people talking about Mott. It doesn't mean people didn't use Mott before that because the Europeans used Mott, right? But they <laughs> didn't focus on it the way we were going to focus on it after 1984. And then second, <clears throat> I wanted to uh, introduce the Husia, which I had translated. And I saw that as a 20-year project. 
It's actually almost 40 years and I'm still working on it. This is a slow and meticulous kind of work. The same work that early Christian scholars, early Muslim scholars, early Hindu scholars, early Mayan scholars, uh, uh, all the other scholars that do sacred texts, Buddhist scholars, etc. The work that they did to, to put their uh, sacred texts together, even though people said, you know, it came from heaven, actually people wrote it down. We, we have to be honest enough. They wrote it down. Regardless of how they say they got it, they wrote it down. So. And somebody had to translate it, and somebody had to interpret it, and somebody had to choose what would be best, right? And so this is what happens, is that we continue continue to learn from all this. And so we wanted first to introduce Mott as, as, as a fundamental way and, and, and of int, understanding Egypt, and that has become established now. Second, we want to introduce the Husea, which I'm still working on, uh, the sacred text. Um, actually, People used to call for a black Bible. I said, no, we don't need a black Bible. That's a Christian text, right? We don't, it's just like we don't need a black Quran. We need uh, a black sacred text that is the oldest and most relevant to us, right? As an African people. And so it doesn't mean other people can't uh, believe in the Bible or the Quran or the Tamu, uh, pardon me, or the Torah or the um, Dhammapada of the Buddhists or the Popovu or the Mayans or the Bhagavad Gita of the Hindus. It's a lot of black people into those things and I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I support them in their quest for spiritual grounding. But I said, I wanted something African and I wanted a text that had originality and authenticity for me, right? And I could read it myself, translate it myself. And so that was it. Then I wanted to make it available to the people, right? Uh, so, you know, people always say they want this, but they'd say where can we find it and so i wanted to get it so people could read it and see the beauty of it and use it as i said earlier to ground themselves orient themselves and direct their lives toward good and expansive end i also wanted to create a community of scholars that was my dream to have a people and I, if we had created this scholar the community i wanted we would have had this husia right in 10 years maybe Ooh. 20 if not 20, 10. But guess what? We couldn't do it. And we, like you said about that other thing, we, we can talk about that later because I want to stay on the positive. But that's yeah. what we proposed, the scholarship community to train. And we had to choose between stressing, taking tours or training scholars, building scholarships for people, right? Just think about that. I'm just thinking about that. And I want to, want to say that, you know, we had a chance to do it, but people did not, uh, they didn't take it hmm, as we wanted them to take it. But you know, listen, so I also wanted to introduce it into black studies as a fundamental ethical thought. See, right now, mainly black studies, people teach religion, they teach Christianity, and they have some other things they bring yeah. in there but they don't give anything the pride of place of Christianity. But what I want to do in Black Study is to give a source older than Christianity, older than Judaism, older than Islam, older than Hinduism, right? Older than yeah. any other written text I know, right? Some of the texts go back 8,000 years, right? So I think it's very important for us to speak our own special culture truth to the world. And yes. I think ethics as one of the most important conversations we can have, Felicia, today. Ethics involve everything we do. That's why we have business ethics, environmental ethics, medical mm -hmm. ethics, right? Uh, all yeah. kinds of ethics, uh, biomedical ethics. So I think it's uh, very important for us. And then I wanted to use it also as another ground for the movement. You see, I don't want to just learn things. Knowledge is not for knowledge sake. Knowledge is for human yeah. sake. And <laughs> Mary McClavethune, Nana Mary McClavethune said, you know, knowledge is a prime need of the hour, but we want to know what you're going to do with your knowledge. And she said, yes. we must discover the dawn and then share with the masses of our people and our youth who need it most. That's what I think is important. And then, of course, I wanted people to use it as a philosophical option to deal with the problems and challenges that they have and to find solace and to find spiritual grounding for themselves, but to answer the fundamental questions of humankind of africa and humankind so that's just 
some of the things in terms of how we want to. Uh, and so we won't talk about all these issues in the seminar. What we would do is show the rich text of Martian ethics and spirituality, right? For example, I talked to you about um, the four good deeds of Ra from the Book of Vindication. When Ra created the world, he endowed us with four divine gifts, four divine gifts, right? Okay. Life and the right to life. The necessities of life and the right to the necessities of life, the goods of life, the material the necessities of life. And third, he gave us a dual, uh, he called this a third, it's a dual gift. He said, I created every person like his or her own fellow. And uh, and then he said, and I did not command them to do evil. It is in their heart that they decide to do this. And so what he does here is he gives us uh, not only equality as a divine right, but also free will. We can choose to do good, hmm. that is mat, or we can choose to do bad, that is isfat. But there's hmm. consequences for both, right? Uh -huh. And so yeah. finally, the fourth good deed is a moral and spiritual consciousness. And that is the right to believe and worship as we will, to think as we will, right? And so I think it's very important. And that, and that free will is also self-determination. So I want to talk about that. And I want to talk about how uh, Jedi, uh, Jed, the narrative of Jedi, how Jedi introduced the concept of human dignity, which is indispensable to any concept of human rights. And human dignity, shepesu in Egyptian, means a trans, an inherent worthiness that has three characteristics. First, it's transcendent. That is beyond all uh, social and biological identities and characteristics, race, class, gender, sexuality, age, ability, religion, nationality, etc. Second, it's equal in all, no hierarchy. We're all equally bearers of dignity and divinity. And third, mm -hmm. uh, it's inalienable. No one can take it from us because we're born with us. It's born in us, right? And yes. the narrative of Jetty does this in defense of a prisoner. And I want to talk about why the ancient uh, uh, sages and the wise uh, women and men, why they chose the prisoner to defend Mott with. Because guess what? Things are real unless they defend and uplift the most vulnerable among us. The, mm. poor, the poor, the disabled, the stranger, right? The yeah. injured, the ill, the aged, right? All these people, by vulnerable, we mean those more likely to be harmed and injured, right? <laughs> And so the people, as I told you, the disempowered, right? The devalued, the marginalized. That's how you demonstrate. And the prisoner is even today seen as a disposable population. Mm. So when Mott, when Jetty defends the prisoner and says this prisoner is a noble image of God, that we cannot mm. experiment with him or kill him, right? That was the teaching of Shepesso. And I want to talk about that. We have beautiful narratives to talk about, right? And we, we yeah. want to talk about that. So, those are some of the things. And when we get to, uh, I don't, I don't have time for to get to Ifa. When we get to that, I'm going to talk about the beauty of just the whole idea that the Ifa tradition introduces this concept of Aniyan, which means human being and chosen one. This is the only religion I know where everybody is chosen. Not just one, right? Not just one people. Because usually when you have your religion, you're the chosen people. Like the Jews, say they are the chosen people. The yeah. Christians, the Christians say they are the elect, and the Muslims say they are the best, right? The, the Abrahamic mm -hmm. Christians always say it's easy to get. But other people feel they are special to their own God. But oh, the Ifa, Odu Ifa says, all humans are chosen, divinely chosen, and they're chosen not over and against anyone, but chosen with everyone to do what? To bring good into the world and not let any good be lost. And we say that's a fundamental mission and meaning of human life. What a beautiful concept. And to make sure you always remember humans are chosen. Guess what? The same word for human is the same word for chosen one. Anyan means both human and chosen one. Oh, wow. That's the beauty of it. Chosen one. 
So we walk around already chosen. <laughs> yeah, I love that. This is Africa's gift to the world, right? But we yeah. have to retrieve it. We can't ask the oppressor to do it. We must retrieve it. Okay. Yes. Okay. You know, I had a, a question um, when you when you're talking about um, when you you know you're talking about the ethics, right? The um, so can you just share the ethical correlation between um, Odu Ifa and Ma? Right. The basic thing is that they are African traditions, spiritual and ethical traditions, mm -hmm. right? Both of them are directed toward bringing into being a good world. So that when Ra established the world, he established it in Ma'at, with Ma'at, right? And okay, so yeah. the, and the Pharaoh and the priests, both women and men, are tasked with maintaining the righteous order of the world, right? And the righteous order of the world, Kunampu says, in the book of Kunampu, Kunam said, the true balancing of the world is in doing much. That, that's how we balance the world. That's how we keep the world right. In Yoruba tradition, in Ifa tradition, it's by doing ire. Ire means good, right? Being a gentle character, speak, uh, 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 oh, if I verse says, hmm, speak truth, do justice, be kind, and do not do evil for those who are righteous or rewarded uh, or favored by the divine. And ancient Egyptians said, speak truth, do justice, for Ma'at is mighty, it endures, it has been tested, right? Mm -hmm. And it brings one blessedness. Wrongdoing might gain wealth, but it has never brought its wares to a safe point. In the end, it is mock that endures and enables the upright to say, it is the legacy of my father and mother, right? It's the legacy of my parents. And so it's just like them, you know? The reality is that it's about bringing good into the world. All of them are like that, but they're distinct. They're intersect, but they're distinct. And I want us to always see that so that we can learn yes. to appreciate the rich variedness of our ancient knowledge and how useful it is even today. It remains relevant and resonant with our lives. Yes. You know, and I like something you said in the beginning, because, you know, we can't, we really can't do anything. We can't be free if we don't know ourselves. Right. If we don't like that. We don't be ourselves. Yeah. If we don't be ourselves, but it's like, how do you be yourself if you don't even know yourself? That's you know? The and that's yeah. why we said the first struggle, and we don't move from this since it's 60, the first struggle is a culture struggle. Right, the culture yeah. struggle to break the monopoly that the oppressor has on so many of our minds. We said yeah. until we break the monopoly that oppressor has on so many of our minds, liberation is not only impossible, it's unthinkable. People can't yeah. even imagine it. And if you can't yeah. imagine reform, how do you practice freedom, right? And so if some people believe they're already free, you sound like you wow talking to them about freedom if they say like we used to say in the 60s we say how you doing we said just trying to be black they say i'm already black see but now see listen to that i say i'm just trying to be black right and they say no i'm already black right you're black in color but are you a black in culture and consciousness we say black mm. is not just a color it's also what culture and consciousness to ground yeah. yourself in the best of your views values and practices and to use that in a self-conscious way to transform mm -hmm. self-society in the world for the good, for the good, right? It's always for the good, right? It's always for the good. Always for the good. Yeah. Raise it up, praise it, and pursue it. Mm -hmm. Yes, you. I like what I like this right here. Culture. Uh, we use uh, don't use call for do not use culture as a reference, but as a resource. Yes, like that changes the whole. That changes everything. That's right. So a lot of people know Harriet Tubman's name, Nana Harriet Tubman. 
Oh, now Herod Tubman went and saved some enslaved people. But that's not all. The question is, what was she thinking? How did she imagine freedom in an unfreedom, savage situation? One of the most savage and dehumanizing and inhuman systems you can imagine, right? But she thinks of freedom and she practices freedom against all odds. And she not only practices it, but understand it's a shared indivisible good and that she has to share it with others for it to be real. Yes. It's that's, a shared that's, individual. That's, what we, that's using it as a resource. Yes. So if somebody bring up their philosophy, you bring up yours. That's the difference yeah. when between the black feminist and a womanist, right? Black mm. feminists might be drawing from white sources, right? I, I had that same conversation with my dean. I fought her for 10 years to get a position for black women to teach themselves, right? She said, we already have a women's studies department. I said, no, you have a white women's studies department, right? Absolutely. She said, well, don't say that. Why do you say that? I said, she said, what's the difference? I said, in the white women's studies department, black women are a topic, but in black studies, they are subject. Yes. They're the subject of their own history. They yes. speak their own special culture truth. They don't end yes. up studying in, 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 in feminism the, uh, the grounding text, a white text. They might put Alice Walk in there later or Audre Lorde for some reason, right? But in the final analysis, the overwhelming documentation and the theories that you use to interpret Black people, it, guess what? From white sources. So mm. I asked ourselves, uh, do we need somebody to bring us God? to some, can, can we live in the world? We be the first people and God wait until white people come along to tell us the news? Uh, well, we can believe that, but I don't know if it's good, right? So the yeah. reality is that what did we think about ethics and spirituality before the coming of disaster and Holocaust? What did we know? Yes. That's what we've got to deal with. We got to rescue that reason. And then we can, you know, we can have these other traditions we want, but don't turn our back on our original grounding and do what the yeah. wants us to do see it as just un, unsavable uh, savagery and paganism. And that's one of the problems with the Abrahamic tradition. They got a name for everybody don't believe what they believe. So the Jews say, the heathens, the Christians call you pagans, the Muslims call you kafir, right? Well, you know, why you got to call me a name, bro? I'm just, <laughs> hey, hey, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm before all these traditions, right? I'm before all of these traditions. I mean, yeah. I don't defer to other people that come after me and, and develop some other thing. And a lot of it is borrowed from and built on what we taught the world, right? So yeah. I'm, just saying, I'm just, hey, I'm just saying, can we actually rescue and reconstruct our own history? We talk about Sankofa all the time. What does Sankofa mean? Reach back and retrieve it. Yes. Reconstruct it and use it to ground ourselves or in ourselves. And again, direct our lives toward good. An expansive eating. Yeah. You know, um, it, God, I just thought about what you said. Um, you know, that in the beginning, that was our only free mind. Mm -hmm. Like that was our, that was how we thought about things until, you know, until savagery and all these other things started to um, poison it. But Tarzan. That that's why Malcolm said, oh. uh, Nana Malcolm, I have to give him, Nana Malcolm, Haji Malcolm. Haji is his honorific for making the trip to Mecca as Muslims do. Haji Malcolm said that, you know, we must wage a cultural revolution. This is part of how I'm informed in Kawita. We must, because Kawita is based on, you know, the best of African thought, and uh, Nana Malcolm contributes to that best of thought. So he said we must wage a cultural revolution to unbrain what wash a whole people. And until we recapture our identity and, and heritage, we can never break the bonds of white supremacy. Those are his words. We can never break the bonds of, of white supremacy until we recapture that culture, that history, that heritage, and that identity, that rich and ancient identity that's there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's your shield. It's your mm -hmm. shield for the world that we live in. Like, yes. You know, like capturing that is the shield. That's yes. what you can go back to. It's, oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. And we have to walk up right. 
and not bend over in the pale shadow of our oppressor. This guy's a newcomer. You know what I mean? And yeah. he, was, he was able to impose himself by force and violence. But we've got to free ourselves and be ourselves and make our own unique contribution to the forward flow of human history, right? Yes. That's what we've got to do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, family, if you are enjoying this conversation, could you please um, like and share this video? I do want to um, just give a special shout out because I saw you guys um, contribute to the Cash App. Thank you. You know, that's how we uh, keep it in the family. Um, Dennis Bolt, right? Thank you. Uh, Lorenzo Small, thank you. Ronnie Gerido, thank you, thank you, thank you guys for um, contributing to our um, to our cause. Thank you so much. So, Dr. Karanga, this uh, as soon as I saw the email that you guys sent over, and I was like, reparations, yes. I wanted to just first, if you can just um, just define what reparations means, mm -hmm. you know, to you. Or how you view reparations, if that's me. Yeah, that's appreciate what you said, Asante, Asante. Thanks for the question, Felicia. I appreciate it. <clears throat> See, look at the word reparation. In it is the word repair. And so, a simple, quick definition of reparation is a repair of a gross and grievous injury and harm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, the whole question is, what is that injury? And the injury is threefold, but the original and root injury is the Holocaust of enslavement. The second is the savagery and barbaric violence of segregation. And the third is continuing racism, right? Which leads to impoverishment, domination, deprivation, and degradation all through, right? And so we see reparations on another level in our struggle for reparations as achieving justice for our people, accountability from the oppressor, and a transformative struggle that in fact changes the way we understand and live our lives, do our work, and wage our struggle. There are several aspects to reparation. Most of the time when people talk about reparations, Felicia, they talk about getting a check. And I want them to get the check. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's a little more difficult than that. Right. It's a little bit more complex with that. So to really repair ourselves, giving us more money won't do it. But it's important because we need money now. And I don't want anybody to think I didn't say we didn't need that. But I want us to see it in a larger picture. Right. So first, there is a need for reparations being a dialogue about what rep what the Holocaust is, I uh, pardon me, what reparations is, what the Holocaust is, what is the nature of our injury? If we don't establish a real injury, right? Mm -hmm. And we don't know what the root injury is, right? Then how do we demand repair of it? Right? Exactly. That's we've exactly. got to. And in that discourse and that dialogue with ourselves, we also have to have public discourse with the dominant society and get them to stop denying the harm they've done to us and wanting us to stop talking about it and trying to redefine what race is and penalizing us for telling them they're fighting with each other. You know what I mean? I'm, yeah. I'm against all that, right? And so we have to have this discord because people still aren't clear about what reparations is beyond getting a check. All right. Second, race, uh, reparations re requires admission of the original and root cause of all of this. Admission mm -hmm. that is Holocaust. It's not slave trade. It's not slavery. It's <clears throat> Holocaust. And I'm telling yeah. you the difference. If we say slave trade, it's like business gone bad with collateral damage. I didn't really mean to hurt y'all. I was just trying to make some money, right? And y'all are collateral damage. All these millions mm -hmm. dead, all this savagery against us, that's collateral damage, right? Uh, now, a second, it's not slavery. Slavery looks natural, right? That's why we don't just call African slaves anymore. We call them enslaved African. When you say slavery, what you've done is created social death for black people. They don't exist anymore. You participate in that, but I want to get to that in a minute. 
But when we say enslavement, that raises a question. Who did the enslavement? And it reminds us we weren't enslaved once. We were free once, right? Mm. And therefore, we got to go now. Slavery doesn't tell us anything except our status. Enslavement tells us what happened to us and reminds us of who we were before this happened to us. That's the yes. that's Egypt, right? Now, now, so we got to have them to admit this is Holocaust. And what is Holocaust? Usually we associate that with Jews, right? Mm -hmm. But Holocaust is an English word. The Jewish word, they have uh, three words for uh, 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 Holocaust. They're Holocaust. Holocaust is Seth, Choban, uh, and then Shoah. Shoah is the most widely used word for the Jewish Holocaust. Just like Ma'angamizi is Holocaust for us. And there's a difference between Ma'afa and Ma'angamizi. Mangamiza, even though I, you know, I accept people using my offer, but my offer could just mean an accident. It does not show intentionality. No. It doesn't, it doesn't, it, show, it could be an accident. If you read Swahili papers and you read Swahili literature, you know it's used for accident also. It can be a disaster, but it can be an accidental disaster, not an intentional one. So okay, that lessens the meaning. <laughs> yes. So we say my angamizi. Angamizi is to in, intentionally destroy. All right, we said this uh, like in the early 80s, maybe before, and we said we need intentionality here. The Europeans did this intentionally, and we need a word for that. And so I chose the word ma'angamizi. Now it's become in the Swahili dictionary. It wasn't before. When we first said it, it was not in the Swahili dictionary. Now they have it in it. Ma'angamizi means uh, great and intentional destruction. Angamiza means to destroy intentionally, and ma in front of it means great. It's an, what we call an amplicative, an amplicative, it amplifies it, right? So ma great intentional destruction. That's what happened to us, right? So that, that, that's important. So we need to get people to admit that, right? We have to, yes. the Holocaust, it, let me define it, as a morally monstrous act of genocide that is not only against the targeted people, but also a crime against humanity. Mm. And it expresses itself in three basic ways. The morally monstrous destruction of human life. Millions of law, lives taken. People killed in various ways. Buried alive, burned alive, bored alive, skinned alive, and left for brain dead in the Western Hemisphere. That's intentional destruction, right? Great destruction. There's a millions. We don't even know how many, right? Second, the moral and mass destruction of human culture. Not just destruction of small villages, but the destruction of great works of art and literature, right? And music. And the people who made them. Cities and towns. Yes, and villages also. But cities, towns, whole countries and empires. All that destroyed because of white people or the colonizers and imperialists had the capacity to do it and didn't have the moral restraint not to. And then finally, the morally monstrous destruction of human possibility, lifting us out of our own history and culture and making us a footnote in forgotten casualty in white history uh, and, 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 and creating for us social death and by social death, I mean, we no longer exist as human beings. We no longer are relevant in society except as objects. Objects in three ways. Objects of labor, sex, and entertainment. And you will notice they've kept that three going. Think about it now. Objects of labor, of sex, and entertainment. Even sports is entertainment for them. They used to have us fight to death for their entertainment, right? They had us jump over the broom and make us think that was our marriage ceremony. Can you imagine that? Why not jump over a spoon or a frying pan? There's no value in jumping over no broom. This is the European trying to erase our memory and open up our mind so he can pour his filth in it. This oh is the This is the a morally monstrous creature, right? Amazing. And so 
we need that. And then we need uh, apology after we get to that. I have to go quicker than that. We, I should have said, Timo, you always tell me, do the whole outline and then come back. Because sometimes you... Wow, no, this is too good. good. No, this is too good. I mean, I, this word right here. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think I'll ever use my alpha again. Oh, yeah. that, that's, that does nothing. It's, all, it's almost like a joke. If you no, say that, it oh, isn't disaster, but it's not as strong. It's not as yeah. strong. We believe as manga means it. It's not as dope. It is a da yeah. it is disaster. It's terrible. Yes, but it doesn't show intentionality. And if people don't do things intentionality, that's a different level of culpability. They're not as guilty. Yes, they did it by. That's what they said about the Native American. Well, we didn't mean to kill all. Of, I mean, this was just uh, we we came and they died from a lot of disease. But they planted the disease. That was a, one of the first examples of biological warfare. They put the smallpox in the blanket and gave it to them as gifts. Yes. And they knew they were killing them from these new diseases. The Native American had no defense again. And they kept coming. And they kept spreading yes. it, right? That's intentionality. And so That's it is with us. Those deaths that I talked about are intentional death to break our spirit, to kill us, and mm. to, to empty our minds. Pour their filth in it and make Pour us, filth in it. you know, make us compliant to their mm, evil, radically evil ways, right? So mm -hmm. I, I've given you three things, dialogue, admission, and apology. Now listen to the apology. Who makes the apology? The federal government. Why? He make, the federal government makes it on behalf of the white people of America. Because guess what? The federal government legalized enslavement. They enforced enslavement. They they made laws to make it uh, a criminal a crime to even help an enslaved person get away and to harbor one or to shelter one or to facilitate one's escape. Look at this. And they use force and violence of police, army, navy, vigilantes, right? Mm -hmm. Just think yeah. about it. And I don't like uh, someone to put up on about uh, the slave trade. I want us to also not to use that again as a substitute for Holocaust. There's an economic dimension to this, but there is a moral dimension that takes into consideration all of that. In fact, let me tell you this. The Jewish people also were deprived of economics. They were of economic value. They took their monies, right? Mm -hmm. They turned their skins into lampshades, right? Mm -hmm. They deprived them of all the wealth they had. So there was an economic dimension to the Jewish Holocaust. But notice the Jews don't concentrate on that. It's just like, uh, I'm, I'm going to give you another way. This is why we say, and, and you know, Kawita put so much emphasis on definition. We say definitions are not just descriptions of reality. They become forms of reality when we embrace them and use, yes. them, use yes. them to guide and ground Absolutely. our lives. One time there was no Negro, right? But mm -hmm. the white man described African as a Negro, right? The Shanti as a Negro, the Igbo as a Negro, <laughs> the Congolese as, uh, as a Negro, and it became a reality, a lived reality, right? and a source of uh, oppression for us. So I, I want us to be correct in our categories, right? And know that there is a dimension, but it's not really trade that happened. Walter Rodney in his classic book, How You, you have Under, How You Have Underdeveloped Africa tells us what? He says to us, we cannot call this trade. There's too much violence in it. And I've yeah. used this example so many times. Some of you might have heard me say it. Is that if I go into a store and I put down money and I get a product and say to the owner, have a good day. But if I go in there, attack and kill the owner, rape his wife, kidnap his children, I can't go to court and say I was just trading. I can't. So if I can't use violence to get what I want, right? And, you know, be, be innocent. How can they call what they did trade when there's so much violence to it? So much violence. That's the defining feature of racism. See, people, 
confuse racism and racial prejudice. Racial prejudice is just an attitude of hatred and hostility toward people different and vulnerable. But racism is being able to turn that hatred and hostility into public policy and socially sanctioned practice. And so when you look at it, that's what racism is. You know, first an imposition. It's defined by violence. That's the first thing racism is, violence, right? Conquest, genocide, incarceration, punishment, all by psychological and physical violence, sexual violence, right? It's violence. And second, it's ideological justification for the violence. And third, it's insti institutional arrangement to perpetuate and promote the imposition and the ideology. So what we need to do is make sure when we say things, even if we say them, say, but this is really the way it is, right? And then, then so, so we need the American government to apologize. Then we can go forward. The next thing we need is uh, recognition. They have to be on monuments and they have to integrate it into the public education system and the higher education system where we teach the meaning and horror of this Holocaust, not only to African people, but to this country and the world. The world needs to know that. Now, we know this about the Jewish Holocaust, but we don't know it about the Native American Holocaust. And I always like to say this, right? So you can, you can know I think this is a moral issue. This country killed at least 14,500,000 Native Americans. When, when the Europeans came to this country, there were by conservative estimate, 16 million people. By 1800s, there was 500,000. 15 million people destroyed, right? And there is not a Holocaust memorial for them. There's a Holocaust memorial for Jews killed in another country, but not for Native Americans killed in their own land here. Just think about this. I don't know why you say restart. I can't. Too much, do you think I need? I don't need to do this. I'll just take it off. Yeah. I think. Okay. <clears throat> that was something came up on my computer. <laughs> I, you just I, left I, us. You I, just I, left us emotionally right there, Dr. Karanga. I, you just I, left I, me like on the on the cliff. <laughs> yeah. So 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 I'm saying that this country would never be a good country, never be a just and good country until it comes to turn with the legitimate claims of the Native American people. So this re recognition, we need a, a, a monuments. We need recognition that this happened because people forget. You get your check, you might go on. People forget it the next generation. But why would, should we forget our ancestors? Millions and millions of people who yeah. died in struggle or died suffering, right? Unjustly, right? We can't forget them. That's why the Honorable Marcus Garvey, Nana Marcus Garvey said, what greater gift can we give to our ancestors than the struggle for a free Africa? And when he said a free Africa, he meant not only the continent, but the world African community. This is the dream of our forefathers and foremothers that we would be free one day, that we will remember who we are and celebrate them as the awesome figures in human history that they are, right? We owe it to ourselves. Then the four, uh, the uh, fifth thing is compensation. Compensation. Okay, now here's a check. Okay, <laughs> Look at all that that came before the check talk, right? Now, but guess what? Not only do we see check, giving a check as important, but what about other things, compensation? Free health care, free housing. My, my thing is free education from K-12 all the way through the university. And not just money to do that, but the structure to make sure the outcome is real, that we actually yeah. succeed, right? Absolutely. Our land back. We got to have a conversation about that. That's what I meant by the dialogue, the communal internal dialogue. Some people don't need reparations. Oprah don't need reparations, right? Barack don't need reparations, right? The masses need reparations. We got to talk about that, but then we got to talk about who they are, right? And then, of course, the last thing is prevent. No, the two things: the preventive measures. The preventive measures means that this could happen again, and the only way it won't happen again is that we raise struggle to change society, right? That's it, and therefore reparations must be a part of our overall struggle for liberation. And that brings me with the last point: 
transformative struggle that changes not only uh, society, but also ourselves, as well as the world. And I want to close by saying this. We must, in this struggle, see ourselves as wounded and injured physicians who, in the process <clears throat> of healing, repairing, renewing, and remaking themselves, also repair, renew, and remake the world. Again, see ourselves as injured physicians who in the process, and this is, it should have been this way, injured physicians who in the process of repairing, remaking, in the process of repairing, renewing, and remaking the world, actually repair, renew, and remake ourselves. You know why that's important? First, injured physician. That's to show you we have the will and the knowledge to do this. We, we must heal ourselves, right? But we yes. cannot heal ourselves in a sick society, right? This is the pathology of oppression that gives us pathology, right? Makes mm -hmm. us sicker, makes us more vulnerable to COVID and to all the other diseases that disable us, right? It's a yeah. sick society and the psychological sickness of it affects us too, right? And so what we must do as Fanon taught, we must clear the society from its contaminants, right? Racism, sexism, classism, right? All these isms that are constraints on human freedom and a violation of human dignity, we must, in fact, sweep that out, right? And if we do that, guess what? We have cleaned and made a healthy society that can produce healthy people. You can't get well in a sick situation. You can't be well in a sick situation. I mean, and in a sick society, it's hard to be well. And that's why you need a culture covering. That's <laughs> your, what they call it, PPEs, your personal protective equipment. It's your yes. culture, right? <laughs> Otherwise, you'll be whistling Dixie yeah, and think you're being black. I said, and I'm closing with this, we are American by habit and African by choice. And every day and in every place, we must choose to be African. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes, yes. I think we just about ended, right? <laughs> yes, yes. I just, I got one question about reparations, though. Okay, good. So, so now, so, I mean, you've laid out what reparations is um, and, and why it's important. And I just want to know, why is it that there has been groups of people who've gotten reparations for, you know, all types of atrocities, correct? But then why, why do, why is it such a challenge for us to get reparations for our, wait, um, my pronunciation is not going to be that great, but I'm going to try. Um, you said uh, Maga Mitzi? Maga Mitzi. Maga Mitzi. Ma Maga Mitzi. Maga Mitzi. Mitzi. Maga Mitzi. So why has it been so hard for us mm -hmm. to, to well, get this done? The first three things I told you, right? Mm -hmm. First, they don't want to talk about it because it's a self-indictment. Mm, they have to admit They don't to want it. to admit it because it's a self-indictment. They don't want to apologize because it would mean they accepted their culpability. Mm. And so rather than go through that, they just deny it, right? They yeah. refuse to admit it, then they don't have to apologize. In fact, they turn the table and make laws to outlaw your teaching the Holocaust of enslavement, teaching racism, Absolutely. right? Yes. Uh, they want to be free from their quote unquote sins against <laughs> and crimes against humanity. You see, they don't want to accept their culpability, their guilt in what they've done to us. That's the problem. And you remember now when the Japanese got it, they um, had to fight for it, and they only got twenty thousand dollars per surviving per, uh, surviving uh, people. But the Japanese took it because they knew how much money meant to the European, right? How much money means to a capitalist society. It was symbolic. Yeah. But then they had recognition, build monuments, and they began to integrate it. And so we have to do in the in the school system. We have to do it. And we can't have white people teaching us that. 
we waged a mean struggle that was another milestone in the struggle for black studies and ethnic studies uh, in, this, in, in California. Uh, the dean was going to shut down our program, turn it into, shut down our department, turn it into a program. And he did this for all the other ethnic studies uh, departments and units, but I resisted. Now, I told him I didn't become chair of the department to preside over his dissolution, so I was going to fight. And so I, I got the students involved, the staff involved, always four elements, the students, the staff, the faculty, and the community. And I got the community involved. And then I went to the legislature. And Dr. Shirley Weber, who as a comrade of mine and colleague of mine, who served with the National Council of Black Studies. In fact, she gave me a job when she was chair at San Diego State University. Wow. She took up the case and pursued it. And we were able to, uh, first of all, First of all, uh, call a moratorium, a scientist, call a moratorium on uh, the changes in our departments. And I asked not that it just be for the Black Studies Department. I asked that it be for all the Ethnic Studies Department because it's an attack on all the people of color. White must be right and different, right? And they must lord over us. And they must practice those three things I said earlier, domination, deprivation, and degradation. They, they can, it's hard for them to get out of that, right? But what we did is then went to the legislature and Dr. Shirley Weber proposed using the language of a report that we authored, using that she created a bill that made it a requirement for all the 500,000 uh, students graduating from Cal State system, the whole state, which has 500,000 students, all of them have to take an ethnic studies uh, course before they graduate. Can take it in African studies, Native American studies, Chicano Latino studies, or Asian studies. Mm. Must take it. And one of the things we argued for and got is that we don't have white ethnics thinking they should be in it. They didn't like us when we first started in '66. They create they called us segregationists, uh, separatists, right? Not segregated, separatists. We want to separate, and they were trying to be just white. Now that we know that it's a uh, 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 in the Roman uh, producing uh, practice, all of them want to teach ethnic studies, but we told them they can't do that, just like they can't teach physics if they don't have grounding in it. Only only the people that have grounding in ethnic studies should teach it. And we have to expect oh. what we call disciplinary deference, defer to us who are the experts in the discipline. So. All of this is a struggle because they don't want to put us on the same level as them. We're already on the level. They just don't want to recognize. Same yeah. thing happened when we created Kwanzaa, right? White people come out of the woodwork. Why are y'all going to celebrate that? And they just find all the things, attack me, attack the holiday itself. But you know, the real reason is they cannot get used to anybody being celebrated but white people. <laughs> this yeah. is a year in. And also, guess what? We open up space for Jews to begin to make national and put a lot of emphasis on their culture. Before us and the structure, the freedom struggle in the sixties, people hid their culture. Rescue me if I'm wrong. Tell yeah. me somebody else that talked culture uh, like we did, right? They hid it, but once we did it, and once we de defiantly declared ourselves African, then they began to turn back and look at yes. Them. And begin to talk. So you know what? Never give us credit for it. Never give us credit for introducing education as a basis for improving the world, society. Like Mary McLaughlin and all our great leaders taught. Right? Uh, uh, I just think it's so important for us to remember how we fought for relevant education. And by relevant education, we said that is. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, meaningful to the student, useful to the community, and reflective of world reality. And when we say meaningful to the student, grounding in their own culture, right? Speaking their own special culture truth, creating space for them yes. to realize and understand themselves in relationship to the rest of the world. Second, that it's useful to the community. It aids the community in meeting its challenge, solving its problems, and developing itself in the most beautiful and expansive way. And finally, that it reflect the realities of the day. And that reality was struggle and revolution, right? And restructuring society in the most radical 
way we could conceive it. So I still think we need a relevant education and we're still struggling that battle, but it's a good fight. It's a beautiful struggle. Yes, yes. You know, it's something, you know, it, it, it's, okay. So when you talked about, um, when you talked about uh, Nana Harriet Tubman and you uh -huh. said it wasn't enough for her to see it on the other side for herself. That's she, right. That's exactly what you did. It wasn't mm -hmm. enough for you just to fight for black studies. You fought for all of us. Yes. That's what's up, Dr. Karanga. That's, That's right. what's up. Yeah. Let me, yeah. let me tell you what one of our foremothers said that's so beautiful here. She said, we take our stand mm -hmm. on the solidarity of humanity, the oneness of life, the, the oneness, oneness of life and the unnaturalness and injustice of all favoritism, whether they are sex, race, condition, or country. And by condition, I mean class or, you know, any other condition. Just yeah. think about that. The oneness of life. Is that beautiful? Who teaches that better than we do? Who has the most ancient texts on that? Exactly. I mean, I'm just telling you. I think it's, I'm going to have to go. I, yes. Oh, oh Tim you reminded me to say who said that. Nana. Anna Julia Cooper. <laughs> yes. Anna Julia Cooper. But I really have to go. I, yeah. I don't want to leave. Thank you. But I want to I want to leave it saying a couple of things. Okay. Number one, I want us to remember ourselves in the most expansive ways. And I like to quote three people in this um in this black History Month to Woman Folk. You know, we celebrate in our organization two months of Black History, Black History Month one, General Focus, and Black History Month two, Women Focus. So, General and Women. So, this month, Black History Month two, March, is Women Focus. And we can never just talk about women without the men, mm -hmm. even if we talk different sexualities and things. Yes. Without black men and women being in harmony and in mutual respect of each other, we can't yes. have a good world. That's what the Odu Ifa says, right? We can't have a good world if we don't have this kind of relationship. And it doesn't have to be an intimate relationship, right? But it must be a mutually respective relationship okay. in life, love, work, and struggle. Either way, you can take it either way you want. Okay, so, so <clears throat> I want to start with uh, Howard Thurman. Nana Howard, Howard Thurman, the deep uh, spiritual man, right? Deep thinker. And he told us to think of ourselves as riders of the storm. He said, it's, it's a beautiful thing to know you can re ride the storm and remain intact. Mm. To ride the storm and remain intact. I, I just love that. Thing. Second, Nana Gwen Brooks, Port Laureate. She says, we are people who must conduct their blooming in the noise and whip of the whirlwind. I mean, how does a people bloom in a whirlwind? Just mm. think about that, right? The same way we ride the storm and remain intact. And finally, Nana Nanny Barrows uh, said to us, yes. we specialize in the holy impossible. That's us. We must think of ourselves. That's an expansive conception of ourselves. That's why I said we're injured physicians, right? And then finally, I wanted to say this. This is our duty. Out of all I've said, this sums it up. This is our duty to know our past and honor it, to engage our present and improve it, and to imagine a whole new future and to forge it in the most ethical effective and expansive ways and this two black people as i close continues the struggle keep the faith hold the line love our people love and respect our people and each other practice the nguzo saba the seven principles umoja unity kuji chagulia self-determination ujima collective working responsibility ujama cooperative economic near purpose Kaumba creativity and imani faith. Yes. Seek and speak truth. Do and demand justice. Be constantly concerned with the well being of the world and all in it. And dare help rebuild the overarching movement that prefigures and makes possible 
the good world we all want and deserve to live in and leave as a legacy worthy of the name and history African. Thank you. Thank you. Thank oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I took two pages of notes. <laughs> this is this you cry. Let's stay in touch. We'll talk again soon here. Yes, thank you. And Tim Moya, on behalf of our organization, us uh, and his advocates, and Tim Moya, my companion, my wife, my companion in all things good, beautiful, and sacred, we say, among us, you will always find your family and friends, and we wish for you blessings without number and all good things without end. Asante, oh. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I we will we'll talk. Know how to exit. Okay. Oh yeah, I'll remove you, and then you just leave the studio. Thank you. Thank you so. Okay, yo, let me tell you. Um, you know when someone's so good that we don't have time to do a lot of promotion about things. Listen, get your one Africa tickets, yo. I, this was like a piece. This is like about an hour and thirty minute little piece of what you will get if you, um, you know, when you sign up and get your tickets for the One Africa Conference. It's April 30th and May 1st. This, this is almost, we're almost like about five weeks out. Get your tickets. If you're in the Detroit area, get them. If you're not, that's okay. We got the live stream, come on to the live stream. You can sit down with your family and watch this uh, two day, just beautiful blessing. It's going to be um, so informative and inspirational, all of that good stuff. I want to thank you guys again uh, for everyone <clears throat> that, um, that gave us um, money on the cash app and the, um, and the super chat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And also, please make sure you are liking and sharing this video. Um, also, you know, we just wanted to, uh, we're going to show a short little trailer. Okay. So some of you guys don't know, you just see happy talks and you, you know, you're, you are involved, you subscribe to us and you see, you know, all these dynamic presenters coming, um, you know, and speaking to us and, uh, and giving us, you know, their, their sacred time every week. Right. But we also happy, we also have an actual movie. It's a documentary. The documentary is two hours and 12 minutes, and it's called Hoppy, the Role of Economics in the Development of Civilization. Okay, you can see this movie. This movie, a lot of, a lot of people who come onto the show, they're actually in this film. And you can go right there to happyfilm.com. Not only sign up for your newsletter, get your cool gear, but you can get a copy of the movie. So as soon as you sign off here, you can actually just go on there, and get the video link. You can download it or you can um, stream it. Okay. It is a film to see because this film is also the impetus for us doing this one Africa conference. We talk about Dr. Leonard Jeffries's, um, and you know, Dr. Karinga talked about this too tonight his pyramid analysis, economics, politics, and culture. You need those three things. And our conference will be representative of those three things. That's what we need for financial independence, economics, politics, and culture. So it's so important, you know, that you guys kind of know, you know, about this show that you guys are, are supporting every uh, week that we actually, and this is not uh, the director, producer, writer, creator of it, Taiki Grant. This is not like his first film. This is his third feature film. So we've been doing this for a minute. So you might want to check out Hoppy if you have not seen the documentary. Check it out. Sit down with your family. And then when you're done, go on back to hoppyfilm.com and get those tickets because you will be inspired by what you will learn when you watch the documentary that you are going to, you, you're going to like run to get your tickets from One Africa. So, um, I'm going to show you, this is, uh, this is one of the trailers. We have several trailers. If you are subscribed to us on YouTube, you can actually just go to our YouTube page and check out um, uh, quite a few trailers for the film. But this is one that um, we want to show you guys. So we have to have our own narrative of what history has been 
and what history is and what history can be used for. As Dr. Clark, our great scholar, said it best, history can be our clock to tell us where we come from, what time it is, and where we need to go. History can be a compass for us to let us know what we have to do and what we haven't done so that we have to make sure that we don't build our narrative of socialization, how we get our values and acculturation, how we fit into society, based upon the lies of European superiority and African inferiority. But we have to understand that we have suffered through a process of dehumanization, but our resilience and our strength has allowed us to rise. And we can say, as my Angelo said, and still I rise. And African symbols of rebirth and resurrection, even after death and destruction, show that the Africans built into their culture a consciousness that out of death and destruction can come new life. And this is what is the lesson of happy, that there is resilience in the ecological systems of the earth, there's resilience in the human family on earth, and there's resilience in the mysteries of the universe and the divine order of the universe that is not fully understood. But it all represents a chance to bring out of death and destruction new life and to do as the Africans understood they were doing, build for eternity. Yeah, that's powerful. Dr. Leonard Jeffries, powerful, powerful documentary. Um, I was just re reading some of you guys' comments. Um, so one, yes, <clears throat> if you, there will be a rebroadcast if you get your ticket for the One Africa Conference. Um, thank you guys for all, um, you know, chiming in, ones that have seen um, Hoppy. Someone asked for our um, cash app. There you go. And, you know, I just want to thank you guys. You guys thank us and we thank you guys right back because it's that's the power in unity. Um, you know, we're so help, we're so grateful and appreciative when you guys sign on and um, and you are experiencing who's sitting here with us. You know, we're experiencing the person together. We were all on a roller coaster ride with Dr. Karanga today. Um, next week, we will have Ron Spears. And we will have Infudichi Juhutimis. It's going to be a powerful show because we will be announcing some conference, like a little conference, uh, you know, um, surprise. So please make sure that uh, you tune in. And I want to thank everyone in the chat that has been, you guys were riding with me. I would be thinking something and see one of you guys um, posting it right away. Um, thank you, um, Nadine, Ellen, and, um, and, you know, I can clearly say, our happy team, uh, Taiki, Brittany, that we are just so happy to be in this space and in this time with you guys. So please make sure you get your, your One Africa tickets and we will see you next week. Peace. I don't know what we can talk about in this nation without talking about white superiority, honestly. Who defines the meaning of God also defines the relationship between economy and God. African Americans spent $1.3 trillion last year, making us the 16th wealthiest nation in the world. Why have we not turned those riches into wealth to develop our communities?